Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash nerdery and murdery. That's betterhelp.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. I, I thought this was about a roller skating rink. Everybody. Welcome to episode 75 of Nerdery and Murdery. Another wife swap. I'm Jeffrey with your Nerdery this week. And I'll be Zig with your Murdery. Outstanding. Love when we do these. We did our last one in episode 50. A lot of fun. And for episode 75, I'm taking over the Nerdery side of the house. And as maybe you can tell from the stab, I'm going to talk about Xanadu. Xanadu. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny because as I talk through this and as I'm going to be hearing the soundtrack in my head, because this is a movie I know very well. I know the soundtrack. I know the movie. I listen to the music all the time. I've seen the movie hundreds of times, hundreds of times. It is a guilty pleasure of mine. I love this movie. And definitely for the nerdery side this is definite nerdery with the movie xanadu i had actually planned this for quite a while for episode 75 and unfortunately before i could even finish all my episode notes dame olivia newton john has passed this mortal coil and unfortunately she is now gone yeah yeah that's tough to hear yeah it was a tough one for me that that was a big one for me i've you know some that are going to be 
harder than others for me. And this one for me was especially hard just because I've been such a fan of hers for such a very long time. I'm not covering her specifically. Like I said, I'm covering the movie Xanadu. And I got my information this week off Wikipedia, the BBC, Real Reviews, National Review, News.com, and Collider. Xanadu is a 1980 musical, American musical film written by Rich, Richard Christian Dennis and Mark Reed Rubel and directed by Robert Greenwald. It stars Olivia Newton-John, Michael Beck, and Gene Kelly. And this was his final his final film role. Didn't know That's if you right. knew that. Yes, this is the last thing that Gene Kelly did. Uh, the film features music by Newton John, Electric Light Ar- Orchestra, Cliff Richards, and The Tubes. And the title is a reference to the nightclub in the film, which takes its name from Xanadu, the summer capital of Kublai Khan's Yuan dynasty in China. The city appears in Kublai Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which was an 1816 poem that's quoted in the film, and I quoted it for our stab as well. Didn't have any notes on that. I actually have that poem, that part of the poem memorized because yes, of this yes, movie. I've, I've heard you rattle it off at any point. It's like, <laughs> hey, what's this? And you just like, I was like, holy <laughs> crap. You just know that? He's got it preloaded. <laughs> I told you it, it is no it is no exaggeration when I tell you that I have watched this movie hundreds, hundreds of times. Yeah, he uh, actually had me sit down and watch it with him one time. And I was like, he was like, you, you're really going to love it. And I was like, it, it's not bad. I mean, <laughs> and, and I feel bad because I made him watch The Naked Lunch, which is way more severe than this movie. Oh, and way more terrible, too. I hate that movie. Uh, Xanadu was a box office disappointment. It earned negative critical reviews, and I did not know this before I started my research. It was an inspiration for the creation of the Golden Raspberry Awards to recognize the worst films of the year. (laughs) Xanadu is the reason we have the Razzies? Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, despite its lackluster performance of the film, the soundtrack became a huge commercial success around the world and was actually certified double platinum in the United States. The song Magic was a number one hit for uh, Olivia Newton-John. The title track uh, reached number one in the United Kingdom and several other countries around the world. Interestingly enough, Magic is the only song on the soundtrack that is not played in its entirety. Really? Yeah, it's only played in a in a small piece of the movie. You hear it uh, playing in the background where she's skating around this old auditorium, but you never hear the entire song unless you listen to the album itself. Thought it was very interesting that Jeff Lynn, who was the creative force between ELO, said he mainly signed on the movie because he wanted to meet Olivia Newton-John, but he, <laughs> but he said he's also never seen the movie because the reviews were so bad. <laughs> Uh, The film Sense has become a cult classic for the way it mixes the storylines for an old-fashioned 1940s fantasy with modern aesthetics featuring late 1970s and early 80s rock and pop music on the soundtrack, as well as for fans of Olivia Newton-John. It was originally conceived conceived as a relatively low-budget roller disco picture. Like Roller Boogie? Yes. Yes. As a number of prominent performers joined the production, it evolved into a much larger project while retaining the roller skating as a recurring theme, especially in the final scenes of the club's opening night. Um, so part of the part of the movie is centers centers around this mural. And early versions of the story established that Michael Beck's character, Sonny, was the artist who created the neur- the mural from which the nine goddesses' sisters has merged. I did not know that before I began researching this, which it makes it a much stronger explanation for the muse's interest in helping him with his artistic ex- uh, uh, success. And Why would they not leave that in? I, don't I know. agree. <laughs> Why not leave that in? I, I, I don't know. It, it's I, a 30. I mean, you could have done it while they were doing the opening credits of him. Actually, someone is painting the mural in the opening. It could have just as easily have been him. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But they kind of, they kind of allude to it in the movie. Um, 
there were continual rewrites and editing during production that that caused that plot point to be lost but but one one line that was spoken by Sonny as he talks about his failure as a freelance artist, he says, I paint his van. I paint somebody else's mural. So it's alluded to, but it's never actually said that he did the mural. But the mural, it becomes a, a, a central focus. So I don't know. It's that plot point got recycled and it's, but it's reused in the stage adaptation of the film because this later became a Broadway, uh, a Broadway success. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also didn't know that Marvel Comics adapted uh, a, a version of it for Marvel Super Special 17. And in the comic, they retained more of Sonny's connection to the, uh, between him and the him and the mural. OK. Uh, the Pan Pacific Auditorium in Los in Los Angeles were used for exterior shots of the nightclub. Xanadu's nightclub interior was built on stage four of Hollywood Center Studios beginning in 1979. Sonny refers to the auditorium as a dump, which was a fair characteristic of the Pan Pacific by then. Danny, who is Gene, Gene Kelly's character, he jokes, they used to have wrestling here, which was a true statement about the auditorium. <laughs> But unfortunately, the building would be consumed by a fire about a decade later. Ah, uh, uh, a bad-looking design on an old building. I no, I didn't. Oil run down. I didn't think so. I loved it. Yeah. That's a good-looking old building. Uh, Universal did cancel press screening with Xanadu, suggesting they were not confident in the film, and it went on to receive negative reviews. Variety called it, quote, a stupendously bad film whose only salvage is the music. Roger Ebert gave the film two stars, describing the film as, quote, a mushy and limp musical fantasy with a confused story redeemed only by Olivia Newton-John's high spirits and several strong scenes from Gene Kelly. Moreover, Ebert criticized the choreography, saying, quote, the dance numbers in this movie do not seem to have been conceived for the film. (laughs) I will give you this. Magic is a great song. Oh, I love that. I love every song on this album. Are you kidding me? Magic Magic is a really good song. Yeah. He also noted that mass dance scenes were not photographed well by cinematographer Victor Kemper who sh- who shot at eye level and failed to pick up the larger patterns of dancers with dancers in the background muddying the movement of the foreground. Why? They have ladders. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Oh my god. Uh, with a combination of contemporaneous and modern reviews, Xanadu today holds a Rotten Tomatoes rating of 29% based on 42 reviews. And the consensus states not even spandex and over-the-top musical numbers can save Xanadu from questionable acting, unimpressive effects, and a story unencumbered by logic. Wow. That is not a good review. <laughs> <laughs> um the German television show, which translates to the worst movies of all time, um, it seems to be that that's kind of a uh, – their their show is almost a mystery science theater 3000 type show. They featured, nice. its, they featured its movie in its third season. Uh, J- Janet Maslin wrote in her review, like The Wiz, Xanadu is desperately stylish without having any real style. In the BBC, they said most of Xanadu's conceptual choices were made from commercial reasons, but instead of leading to something cookie-cutter and audience-friendly, they produced this flailing monster, provoking delight, pity, compassion, and horror all at once. Wow. <laughs> I thought the other review was bad. Jesus. Nobody likes this movie. I do. It's not that bad. I'm going to be honest. Well, I've seen it with Jeff, I saw it originally way back in the day. I wasn't that impressed, but I've seen it with Jeffrey. It's not that bad. No, and then I do have some good reviews on it. On real reviews, they said, "quote Enjoy it for its garishness, enjoy it for its silliness, enjoy it for the soundtrack, but most of all, enjoy it for Olivia Newton-John. She may not be the greatest actress of her generation, but she's gorgeous and she has a great singing voice." She's the reason I fell in love with this movie. Well, of course. You know? You've had a thing for Olivia Newton-John since you were a small boy. I get yes. it. Yes. It, it was Olivia Newton-John for you, Pam Greer for me. I get it. <laughs> 
Uh, Collider did state, it's no secret that we all love so bad they're good movies, and it's even better when those movies are in the musical genre. In many ways, Xanadu fits in this category. We're also fitting into the company of campy cult, cult musicals like the Rocky Horror Picture Show or the Mamma Mia movies. So there you go. Got a couple of good reviews. Yeah. No, Xanadu is way better than Mamma Mia. Oh, I absolutely agree. Way better than a Mamma Mia. Absolutely agree. Uh, a double feature of Xanadu and another musical released about the same time, Can't Stop the Music, inspired the Golden Raspberry Reward, or the Razzies, as we said. Uh, Robert Green- Greenwald won the first Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Director, and the film was nominated for six other awards. It was not. It was nominated for Worst Picture, Worst Director, which it won, Worst Actor, Michael Beck, Worst Actress, Olivia Newton-John, Worst Screenplay, and Worst Original, original Song for Suspended in Time. That's literally every award but two. <laughs> wow. They did not like this movie. No, it was officially proclaimed the worst movie of 1980. And, you know, and if I turn around and look over at my DVD collection, I have it on DVD as well. Yes, you but do. I believe there's also a Blu-ray, which I need to get. Yeah. Yeah, there's special commentary on that one, too. I remember us sitting down and watching the whole thing. (laughs) You know, but over the years, it's really developed something of a cult audience like Rocky Horror. I mean, not to the level of Rocky Horror Picture Show, but it but it but it's developed a cult audience. Oh, yeah. Like like El Topo or or um, um, Play a Nine from Outer Space. Yes. Or Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Yes. Uh, it was a box office failure. It only made twenty three million against a reported twenty million dollar budget. How's so, that a failure? Well, because to be profitable, movies must gross at least twice their budget. After all, costs are taken into account. Okay. So, so it didn't make any money. And it was pretty heavily advertised, if memory serves. Well, from the soundtrack, uh, because I mean that was a major hit. The soundtrack yeah. itself was double platinum in the U.S. and gold in the U.K. Uh, yeah. And the soundtrack com- contained five top 20 singles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, the hell, the soundtrack would have sold the movie by itself. Yes. I mean, there's your advertising. Well, in 2007, uh, there was a $5 million Broadway musical adaptation using the same name. And Olivia Newton John and songwriter John Farrar did did attend it on July 10th, 2007. Nice. In the musical, Kira is the muse, is the muse Cleo, not Terpa score, as she is in the movie. Uh, and there was a plot twist in the in the Broadway version that had evil muse sisters. The show humorously parodied the plot of the film, and it was a surprise hit, receiving not only praise for its satirical approach, but it was nominated for several Tony, Tony Awards, which I believe it actually won. Oh, nice. Um, the Broadway production closed on September 28, 2008, after 49 previews and 512 performances, and then they had a national tour after that. I wish oh. I'd gone to the national tour. Oh, wow. Nice. That's that's pretty successful for a nice Broadway run. Yeah, I just I don't remember if it ever came through here or not. I I I I I wish I'd seen it. I've listened to the Broadway soundtrack and it's really good. It's really really good. So after talking about the the bad critical reviews, the bad uh, the bad showing at the box office, what is this movie about? Yes. <laughs> Please tell us. Uh, so Sonny Malone, who's played by Michael Beck, he's a struggling artist in Los Angeles who's attempting to make his living by freelancing. He rips up one of his failed sketches and throws it into the wind, and the sketch hits the mural of the nine sisters, who's the nine daughters of Zeus, the muses, and it brings them to life. The sisters fly across Earth, but one of them, Olivia Newton-John, roller skates through the town and collides with Sonny. She kisses him before skating away, leaving him confused. So, feeling like he's a failure at freelancing, he returns to his old job. And the first job he's handed is to do is to do uh, uh, album recreations, and they hand him uh, a record over at Airflow Records, and it's. It's got a picture of Olivia Newton-John on the cover. 
uh, when when Sonny goes to the record company to talk about the album cover, he shows it to him, and the and the uh, and the photographer says, "Look, don't tell anybody this because this is one of the best album covers I've ever done." But I'm shooting this. I'm shooting these photos of this auditorium, and in one frame she's not there, in another frame she is, and another frame she's gone again. Don't tell anybody this was by pure accident. Wow. So Sonny eventually traces her across town to the stadium where where she was photographed in front of, and she introduces herself as Kira. This is where you get to hear Magic playing in the background because she's skating to Magic throughout this old, old rundown auditorium that's just filled with boxes. Uh, they instantly are attracted to each other, but Kira refuses to tell Sonny anything about herself. Soon after, Sonny meets and befriends Danny McGuire, who's Gene Kelly, who's a former big band orchestra leader turned construction mogul. And he was once romantically involved with a singer in the 1940s who resembled Kia, but hit, but her departure resulted in his own loss of creative passion. Kira then encourages Sonny and Danny to open a nightclub in the auditorium called Xanadu, and the two begin working on the project as partners, all the while Sonny and Kira are developing their, ro- their romance for each other. Sound good so far? Yeah, sounds like a good story. <laughs> the night before the club's opening, however, Kira does confess to Sonny that she's actually Terpiscor, one of the nine muses of Olympus, and she was sent to inspire the creation of Xanadu, but can't stay despite their mutual feelings. And so Sonny gets very upset at this, but then she has to leave Earth because she has fulfilled her duty, so she's now gone. Danny tells Sonny to keep pursuing Kira, encouraging Sonny not only to give up his ambitions like he did after his own muse left him. And Sonny then goes around roller skating. (laughs) Okay, this is where it starts to drop off. Right. He goes roller skating, just kind of thinking about Kira, and then he comes across the mural, which would have made more sense had they left it in that he he created the mural. So Sonny then skates pell-mell at the mural. And at the last minute, he ends up going through the mural and ends up in Olympus, which is all full of neon, neon and stars. Huh. <laughs> there, Kira comes down to meet him, and she she can't believe that he's there. Sonny refuses to leave with uh, to to leave Olympus without Kira because he's in love with her. At which point, the voices of uh, Zeus and Hera show up. Which Zeus is done by Alfred Hyde White. Alfred Hyde White. Yes, the actor Alfred Hyde White. Yeah, I can't think of anything he's been in. He was an old guy by the time. Uh, yeah. Time this came out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I know who, who we're talking about. Okay, I'm with you. Right, and this is going to lead into what they they said was the worst song of all time, which I don't understand. Suspend me in time, or suspended in time, which I think is a beautiful song. Um, she's Kira is professing her feelings through the song, and she ultimately begs her parents, you know, please let me go down for just a moment. At which point, Zeus and Hera are like, "Is it a moment, or maybe it's forever?" I keep forgetting. So. Then the scene goes to the nightclub, at which point they're they're on opening night. Sonny seems to be kind of happy, kind of sad, because he's doing this without Kira. And then suddenly, through all the roller skating and the neon and the ballet dancers, I mean, this is the 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 nightclub scene was very, I think, very heavily drug induced. Right on. It's a it's a twenty minute end. Um. 20 minute end, which is, is, uh, sandwiched by the song Xanadu. Uh, it's sung through and then it stops. And then you have a scene that's a, uh, 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 a, 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 ca- a cowboy or, or, uh, dead gummit, a Western scene, uh, we're just country and Western. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's what I've tried to go to. <laughs> Oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a country western song. Okay. Country I you western song. It was an actual song. western scene. I was like, I don't remember that. No, and that's what I was trying to get out because it goes from the song Xanadu to a country and western song. And then it goes into what's supposed to be kind of a heavy metal song. And then it goes uh, into a pop song. And then it goes back into Xanadu again. 
like I said, it's a 20 minute finale. Well, this was written in 79, right? Yeah, so written in 79, this... released in 80. Okay, so yeah, this probably would have been written on cocaine. All right, I'm with you. Um, you know, Sonny's happy. He's seeing Kira again. He sees her sisters, and then they all in a in a in in a blaze of of neon and special effects. All the sisters disappear, leaving Olivia Newton John alone by herself on a pedestal, singing the end of the titular uh, song Xanadu. And then she also is suddenly bathed in light and disappears herself. Okay. <laughs> and then Sonny, he's left there uh, by himself listening to listening to the music with all the roller skatings around him. And uh, he talks with, uh, with Danny McGuire for a minute. And then he turns around to a waitress who offers him a drink, who in turn ends up being Olivia Newton-John. And he stops and he asks her to talk. And the movie ends. Huh. <laughs> I know the description of it doesn't make it make it sound so good. I mean, this movie went from tap dancing to roller skating to disco, and there's even a Don Bluth animated segment in this movie where they're romantically, where Sonny and Kira are romantically involved in a in a dance where they turn into fish and turn into birds, and yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, Olivia, Olivia Newton-John is very much the muse of this film. She really yes. is. Her her singing, uh, her dancing, she is very much the muse. She goes from muse to performances of an old Hollywood starlet. And honestly, to me, the music is going to leave you humming for days. And, yeah. and, and you, sh you, you should see the movie and enjoy it for what it was. Don't expect going in for an Oscar winner because it's not. Just enjoy it, Olivia Newton-John, showing off her musical talent at, at some of her best. Really, yeah. it's some of her best. It's some of yeah. her best music. I think, uh, again, I, I would say uh, Magic may be the best song she ever did. I, just, I love that song. This movie killed Michael Beck's career. Was it this or was it Megaforce? Because he was, did it like the next year. It was this movie that killed Michael Beck's career. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, had it not been Gene Kelly, had Gene Kelly not had a long history before this, it might have killed his too. And and could be one of the reasons it's his last film because he just, I, I, it was just so badly received that, that I, that, that I think a lot of them couldn't go on. Olivia Newton John, though, was not hurt by this. She went on to a, a, a mega career with music. Uh, she was already a star because of Greece. Uh, had had great success for that. This was another of her trying to capture that musical, um, that musical success from Greece, and it just unfortunately wasn't. And 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 unfortunately, I don't think my telling of the of the movie is really going to get that many people to go see it. But I think they should. Yeah. I think I think they should give this movie a chance and see her. Like I said, I, I think I think her at her finest. Yeah, no, I would agree with that, uh, especially her her musical prowess. Because yes. what's the next the next thing she did was what physical? Uh, the next, the, as far as music, yes. The next movie she did was Twist of Fate, which was also a huge flop. Oh, the one with John Travolta. <laughs> yes, where they were trying to recapture the magic of Greece. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's, that's me nerding out on, on a movie that I love, that I've always loved. I, 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 I want to watch it again right now because it's, I may it's, watch this this afternoon. <laughs> it's, it's a guilty pleasure of mine and I will watch it over and over and you can't help but hear the music in your head after you see it because the music is just, is, is phenomenal. It is. It, it really, really is. So kids, get out there, see see Xanadu, let me know how bad you think it is, or maybe somebody out there will watch it and say, man, I absolutely love this movie. I can't believe that 
Everybody there's, hates it. And everybody hates it because I, I certainly don't hate it. I, I wouldn't own it on DVD if I didn't hate it. So if, if yeah. I hated it. So so that's the end of my nerdery for this week. So Zig, well, if you want to take over on the murdery side of the house. Murder. Okay. Kids, today we're going to talk about a very serious subject. Um, today we're going to talk about the Holocaust of bullets. All right. Um, the Holocaust of bullets is is the beginning of the Holocaust. It, it's kind of how it started. Gotcha. Um, where 1.5 to 2 million Jews, political opponents, Romas, communists, LGBT folks, teachers, professors, mayors, and local police were murdered. Oh, by, wow. Yeah. By the uh, by the, the German army, basically. The Holocaust uh, by bullets, uh, and the reason it's called that is because there's a memoir, uh, an investigation written by Father Patrick uh, Desbois, a French priest who uncovered the truth behind the murder of 1.5 million Jews in the Soviet Union. I guess I should, yeah, I guess I should say, yeah, between 1.5 and 2 million. Uh, they burned a lot of the records. So, mm-hmm. um, I guess you should say where I where I got my sources from too. Sorry, I don't do these murders very often. Um, I don't I do nerdery very often, so yeah, there you go. I uh, I got it from the the Holocaust uh, uh, of bullets, the, the 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 book itself. Um, uh, the World War Two Museum, uh, the U.S. World War Two Museum, uh, which is based in New Orleans, has a lot on it, as well as the uh, the the U.S. Holocaust Remembrance Museum and some Wikipedia. Um, so this this memoir uh, was published in 2008, and the book details Dubois' journey in locating and locating and studying the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. In the early chapters, uh, Dubois describes his grandfather's story of incarceration during World War II uh, for political reasons, uh, an experience that drove him to study the Holocaust itself. Uh, the book features some of the hundreds of testimonies of witnesses of requisitioned villagers who were present at mass executions that Desbois has collected with the help of translators, historians, and archive scholars. Uh, the memoir brings to light the emotional impact of genocide and the intimate human dimensions of the Nazi extermination. So in the summer of 1941, following Germany's attack on the Soviet Union, Germans began to pen, uh, perpetrate mass shootings of Jewish men, women, and children in territories seized by Soviet forces. Now, I'll say Jewish. They also exterminated political people, gay people, uh, anybody with a mental illness. Um, these murders were part of the final solution to the Jewish question, the mass murder of European Jews. Uh, three key facts <clears throat> are, are kind of his idea on uh, the father's idea on, on this book. The first fact is the Nazi German regime perpetrated mass shootings of civilians on an unprecedented scale. Uh, number two, mass shooting actions were often conducted in broad daylight and full view and earshot of local residents in occupied Eastern Europe. And three, almost one third of the six million Holocaust victims were murdered in mass shootings. So Nazi Germany and its allies and collaborators perpetrated these mass shootings uh, in territory seized from the Soviet Union. Uh, this is sometimes known as the Holocaust by bullets. As many as 2 million Jews were murdered in these mass shootings and associated massacres. Now, again, I keep waffling between the number 1.5 and 2 million people because, again, the Nazis burned the records after it happened. So it's basically – they had to go buy a lot of census data, um, plus not all of the records got destroyed. And uh, there were a lot of uh, – when these these mass graves were liberated, a lot of people were able to go back and identify quite a few of these people. So in 1939 to 1940, after Germany and the Soviet Union partitioned Poland, the Soviets annexed the Baltic states and regions of pre-war Poland and Romania that had large Jewish populations. And then after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, known as Operation Barbarossa, uh, the Germans and their allies and collaborators carried out thousands of mass shooting actions in the territories they seized from Soviet forces. As German forces moved quickly across Eastern Europe, they conducted mass shootings in small towns such as Aishak, uh, moderately sized cities such as 
commence Polusk and large cities such as Kiev. Uh, the civilian administra uh, administrations that Germany and its allies established in the seized territories concentrated on the remaining Jews in ghettos and continued to murder them periodically in mass shootings. Um, Babin Yar. Babin Yar is in or just outside of Kiev. It's basically a little uh, Karst Canyon area outside the city. Um, well, okay. It was a canyon area. What they did was they took all of the people in the surrounding areas, lined them up on the canyon walls, shot them, and dumped lye and dirt on top of them. Oh my Bob God. and Yar is now not nearly as deep as it was in 1939. Mm. Um, it is a mass grave. There is a, there's a very large Holocaust remembrance there at Bob and Yar. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this and I don't want to get overtly political, but the Soviet or the Soviets, the Russian army rocketed Babin Yar three months ago. Um, they said they were aiming for a radio tower, but they rocketed Babin Yar and destroyed the Holocaust Remembrance site. There's a giant menorah there that gets lit every year to commemorate the Holocaust that, uh, that, that they destroyed with a rocket attack. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, you know, uh, ah, I don't understand. Anyway, much of the Holocaust remembrance and research focuses on the role that ghettos, concentration camps, and killing, killing centers played in the Holocaust. Less attention has been paid to the key role that mass shootings played in the murder of the Holocaust's six million victims. The start of the escalation of mass shootings in, in, started in the summer of 1941. In June 1941, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union. Uh, it was actually Poland first, but it was the part that the Soviets had taken a year earlier, or a year and a half earlier. Uh, Germany military and police authorities were instructed to wage a war of annihilation against Nazi Germany's alleged racial and ideological enemies. These supposed enemies included communists, Jews, Roma, uh, and, and uh, various other Soviet civilians. Uh, the, the Jews of the shtetl uh, were murdered by Einsatzgruppen on September 21st, 1941 of Eishach. The reason I bring up Eishach is they killed everybody in the shtetl. There was about 400 people in it, and they wiped them all out. Mm -hmm. And then bulldoze the town so you didn't know it was there. German SS and police units began to carry out mass shootings of local Jews. At first, these units targeted Jewish men of military age. But by August of 1941, they had started massacring entire Jewish communities. Again, like I shot. Uh, regardless of age or gender, this marked a radical escalation in the Nazi anti-Jewish policy, uh, the ultimate culmination of the final solution of the Jewish question. Uh, the Nazi plan to murder all of Europe, Europe Europe's Jews, um, and it started with the legalized discrimination against Jews in Germany, uh, which began immediately after the Nazi seizure of power in January of 1933. Um, the violence and economic pressure was used by the Nazi regime to encourage Jews to voluntarily leave the country. Uh, the, ideolo the ideology of Nazi brought them together elements of anti-Semitism racial hygiene and eugenics and combine them with pan-Germanism and territorial expansionism with the goal of obtaining more Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people. Nazi Germany attempted to obtain this new territory by invading Poland and the Soviet Union, intending to deport or exterminate the Jews and Slavs living there, who were viewed as being inferior to the Aryan master race. Now, part of the problem was, when it started getting bad, for Jews and communists and people with any other ideas besides Nazism, they left Germany, but they didn't go far enough. A lot of them went to Belgium, the Netherlands, to France. A lot of them went to Poland. A lot of the Jews went to Poland because Jews are welcomed in Poland. Not many of them made it to the Soviet Union, Ukraine especially, unless they were communists. And that's when they went there. 
Discrimination against Jews longstanding but extra legal throughout much of Europe at the time was codified in Germany immediately after the Nazis seized power on the 30th of January, 1933. <clears throat> the law for the restoration of the professional civil service passed on the 7th of April in that year, excluding most Jews from the legal profession and the civil service. Similar legislation soon deprived other Jews of the right to practice their professions. Violence and economic pressure were used by the regime to force Jews to leave the country. Jewish businesses were denied access to markets, forbidden to advertise in newspapers, and deprived of access to government contracts. Citizens were harassed and subjugated to a violent attacks and boycotts of their business. Now, this didn't just include nominally Jewish people. This is also people with any Jewish heritage at all. This would have included me and my children. Mm -hmm. um, in September 1935, the Nuremberg Law was enacted prohibiting marriage between Jews and people of German, Germanic extraction, uh, extramarital sexual relations between Jews and Germans, and the employment of German women under the age of 45 as domestic service in Jewish house, households. The Reich Citizenship Law stated that only those of German or related blood were defined as citizens. Thus, Jews and other minority groups were stripped of their German citizenship. A supplementary decree issued in November defined a Jewish as Jewish anyone with three Jewish grandparents or two grandparents of the Jewish faith was followed. By the start of World War II in 1939, around 250,000 of Germany's 437,000 Jews immigrated to the United States, Palestine, Great Britain, and other countries. After the invasion of Poland in September 1939, Hitler ordered that the Polish leadership and intelligentsia should be destroyed. So this is the non-Jews. <clears throat> the Special Prosecution Book of Poland lists of people to be killed had been drawn up by the SS as early as May of 1939. The Einsatzgruppen, or Special Task Force, you'll hear those a lot, uh, performed these murders with the support of the German Self-Protection Group or the Volksdeutscher so, – you know what? I can't say it. It's the German Self-Protection Group, a paramilitary – paramilitary group consisting of ethnic Germans living in Poland. Members of the SS, the Wehrmacht, which was the German Armed Forces, and Ordnungspolice, or the Order Police, or ORPO. Um, they also shot civilians during the Polish campaign. Approximately 65,000 civilians were killed by the end of 1939. In addition to leaders of Polish society, they killed Jews, prostitutes, Romani people, and the mentally ill. On the 31st, July 1941, Hermann Goering gave written or authorization to <clears throat> SS Obergruppenführer, senior group leader, Reinhard Heydrich, uh, chief of the Reich Security Main Office, to prepare and submit a plan for the total solution of the Jewish question in territories under German control and to coordinate the participation of all involved governmental organizations. The resulting uh, General Plan Ost, or General Plan of the East, uh, for use of slave labor or to be murdered. Uh, the minutes of the Wannasee Conference estimated the Jewish population of the Soviet Union to be 5 million, including nearly 3 million in Ukraine. So the Wannasee Conference uh, was a meeting of senior government officials of Nazi Germany and the SS leaders held in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee on the 20th of January, 1942. The purpose of the conference called by the director of the Reich Security Main Office, uh, Reinhard Heydrich, uh, was to ensure the cooperation of administrative leaders of various government departments in the implementation of the final solution of the Jewish question. Now, one of the things that they did was they brought in these or ethnically German um, people in administration, in, you know, in, in the legal and the civil administration in Poland, because they killed everybody who wasn't them, and told them they either they either go with them or they'll suffer the same fate as the others. So, in some cases, I want to be clear: in some cases, some of these agreements were made under duress, mm. but not all. Most of the Jews of German-occupied Europe will be deported to occupied Poland and murdered. 
Conference participations included representatives from several governmental ministries, including state secretaries from the Foreign Office, the Justice, Interior, and State Ministries, and representatives from the SS. In the course of the meeting, Heydrich outlined how European Jews will be rounded up and sent to extermination camps in general government, which has occupied Poland, where they would be killed. Historians disagree as to when and how the Nazi leadership decided that a European Jew should be exterminated. The controversy is commonly described as the functionalism versus intentionalism debate, which began in the 1960s and subsided 30 years later. In the 1990s, the attention of mainstream historians moved away from the question of top executive orders triggering the Holocaust and focused on factors that overlooked earlier, such as personal initiatives and ingenuity of countless functionaries in charge of killing fields. No written evidence of Hitler ordering the final solution has ever been found to serve as a smoking gun. And therefore, this one particular question remains unanswered. Now, I would like to go back to the invasion of Poland. Because the Wannsee opera, the Wannsee conference happened while the Holocaust by bullets was going on. <clears throat> you see, the idea was they weren't killing them fast enough by shooting them and dropping them in these holes. That they needed to find some sort of industrial plant, almost like an abattoir or a meat processing facility. Jeez. That's when they designed the camps. Mm. Because you know, killing two million people in a year's time is not efficient enough. Many different types of German units perpetrated mass shootings in these territories seized from Soviet forces. The most famous are the Einsatzgruppen, or the Special Task Force of the Security Police and SD. However, the Einsatzgruppen view this term in the glossary only had 3,000 personnel who had a wide variety of tasks and were deployed directly behind the entire um, Eastern Front. Now, originally, the Einsatzgruppen was there to help mop stuff up. Like they were, they were. Like the CBs running behind our forces, that's what these guys were originally supposed to be. Other German units, including uh, Order Police Battalions, uh, Waffen SS units, and the General German Military, uh, were also used to perpetrate numerous massacres. The manpower was essentially to carry out the Holocaust by bullets. Furthermore, German units were not the only ones who carried out mass shootings. In many places, they relied upon the manpower of local auxiliary units working with the SS and police. These auxiliary units were made up of local civilian, military, and police officials. In addition, forces of Romania, Germany's ally, carried out mass shootings of Jews in territories they seized and controlled, as well as uh, German people in, who were living in Poland and uh, the Ukraine. But that is about it for the Holocaust of bullets. Well, that was um, awful. Yeah. Well, I figured if we're going to do murders, let's do some murders. Oh, uh, well, yeah, you certainly covered that. That's I mean, that's a terrible time in in our history. Number one, um, mm -hmm. there's there's people today that are trying to proclaim and, and yeah, I don't want to get political at all either, but I know that there are groups today that are trying to proclaim that the Holocaust never happened. That's one of the reasons why this dude, <clears throat> this, 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 this French priest went out and, uh, uh, there are pictures of the grace. Yeah. I, they're, they're included on our website. There's a little old man pointing at what used to be a very deep field or, or deep Canyon because I show it with some of the bodies in it. These pictures are pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, there's a picture of a Nazi shooting a woman and her child. Mm. Um, right before the shot. I mean, the picture is from right before the shot was taken. Um, but yeah, there's a picture of basically this sort of canyon area and then this little field with, with grass, and it's the same area. And it's a little man pointing on, this is where they are. So mm. they found a lot of these bodies they found these mass graves um and in some cases it just has numbers on them right you know hey there's ten thousand people here so there's a monument saying there's ten thousand people here it's just terrible yeah terrible terrible yes and the well, damn russians <clears throat> bombed it three months ago yeah 
Well, I mean, it's important to keep this information going because mm-hmm. his, history has a tendency to repeat itself. And so I think we need to make sure that we know this from our history and mm-hmm. prevent something like this from ever happening again. Yeah, because it's you can I kind of wanted to trace how they went from, you know, you know, hey, hey these are our friends and neighbors to rounding them up and putting them in camps or just lining them up against a, a hole and shooting them. Right. That's essentially what they did. Right. Mm. People knowingly walking to their deaths because they had to do it in lines. Right. Ugh. Just yeah. it's awful. It is. It is good information. I thank you for bringing that thank information you. to us, but truly an awful, awful, awful period of our history. Yes. Yes, it is. Well, um, that about wraps it up for episode 75. Uh, you can find us on our website, nerderymurdery.com, where we have provided pictures and, and lists and, 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 and links. Uh, uh, you can also contact us there. Uh, you find our contact information. You can email Jeffrey about murders. Uh, you can email me about nerder, at nerdery uh, or vice versa. Or you can email Will uh, about just about anything. He likes getting emails every once in a while. Uh, there is a link there also to our Patreon. Uh, so anyone who wishes to help support us, uh, please, please help and support. Uh, Patreons get, uh, you can get episodes early, two weeks early, or, uh, you can also get them. Sorry. You can also get episodes that are exclusive to our Patreons only. Only they can get those episodes. Yep. Uh, we'll have information on our website with that information, you know, the pictures and the links and everything. But the episode itself, you have to go through the Patreon. Um, also, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we also have a, a YouTube channel that you can go out and check out some of our uh, videos and things, things we find funny, things that we think are interesting, uh, or in some cases, song lists, things of that nature. Um, so with that, until next week. I have been Jeffrey with your nerdery. And I'm Zig with your murdery. Cue the music. Cue the music.